everyone. Welcome to the Chicago Justice Show. I'm Tracy Siska, your host. I am also the executive director of the Chicago Justice Project. You can find out more information about what we do every day, fighting for transparency and accountability in the justice system. You can get that at chicagojustice.org. Recent posts include our weekend analysis of weekend media coverage of gun violence over the weekend. Um, we look at what the outlets are doing uh, to the five major station, TV stations in Chicago and the two dailies, Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times. We also, I mean, yes, and we also look at, um, we just started a new piece that posted this weekend, which is a look at basically what the, I don't want to call it alternative media, I don't know, I want to call it political operations hiding like media, sort of, and it's basically in its infant, infant, infancy, infancy, um, but we're starting to do, and we'll be posting hopefully weekly, analysis of what Crime and Wrigleyville blog, Chicago City Wire, and another kind of blog thing. I don't know what it is, except they complain a lot. You wouldn't believe how much they complain. Chicago Contrarian. And whenever they, especially Crime and Wrigleyville, focuses exclusively on crime and violence, but whenever the other sites post on crime and violence, we're going to have a wrap-up every week of analyzing that. Some of that we're going to bring into the show, hopefully. What we're going to be covering today is Mary. Our main segment is on Mary Mitchell's pat on the back for the police column. Ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the Black Caucus signing on supposedly to support the Community Commission. Uh, Vallis, Paul Vallis, mouthing off with no evidence. It's not uncommon for politicians in Chicago, but we're going to keep uh, you abreast of when that happens. And then after the break, we're going to be um, looking at an article from the Tribune about gun. A gun that was used in a horrific crime in Chicago, a crime in Chicago and Evanston, I believe. Um, but kind of a routine article about how it was used in other crimes. That's not surprising. That's been documented a thousand times in Chicago. Then we're going to do our social media fails. Believe it or not, we have repeat guests on that segment. And then we're going to be talking the last one about state violence. Um, I think it's Rock Island, Illinois. Shows you just how disconnected the police and much of the right is from understanding what the police actually do and what they represent and whether or not they represent state violence when they kind of go off the rails and are abusive or violent or kill people for no reason. But first, CJP Nations, uh, our nation program, it's where our volunteers and uh, interns come together to uh, work on crowdsource research projects um, work on social media activism, work on public policy advocacy, doing in-depth research for white papers and policy proposals that CJP hopes to put out, all kinds of things. Um, we usually meet Wednesdays. We're taking a two-week break to let people get uh, students, most of our volunteers, or many of them are college students, to get people get through that and get moved home. We'll be starting back up on the 2nd of June. But you can catch that on Wednesday night. If you want more information, you can email us at Info at chicagojustice.org or volunteer at chicagojustice.org and we will get you information about that. Okay, um, let's go into our first segment here. This is an article, or I shouldn't say an article, it's a column by Mary Mitchell in the Sun-Times. And the headline goes, Chicago Police Department deserves a pat on the back. No mistake about it. And yeah, let me tell you, it had to be hard times for them working through the pandemic, no doubt about it. Now, I kind of question how hard because many, many, many of them are refusing to get vaccinated. So let's not pat them on the back too hard. Let's not break any arms or hands trying to pat them on the back to do it. Um, but I want to talk more in depth about some of the stuff that Mitchell wrote in this column to show you just how ridiculous this thing is. Um, and how it's totally based on BS. But she's a columnist, so she gets to write BS. It is her God-given right as a columnist. So here's a quote. I'm going to read you a couple of sentences here. Given the anti-police climate we are in, I imagine it would be easier to ignore a shots fired call than to rush headlong into the situation where there's a likelihood that things could go awry. Frankly, I don't know who would want to be the police, be on the police force right now. With children as young as 15 and 16 running around with powerful firearms that they aren't afraid to use. No thank you. The reason this is so tone deaf 
is this column has been written by idiots in the media for 50 years in Chicago, at least. Maybe as long as there's been newspapers, probably. Their circumstances are unbelievably bad. They're horrific. No one wants to be a cop. And this time that we are in right now is the worst ever conceivable because we have absolutely no institutional memory about how it used to be in reality. So obviously this is the worst possible time. Now, what she's talking about with a lot of this is the fact that so part of built into that statement in the code of it is that who would want to be a cop if you're held to account for what you do, which is totally hypocritical because she's written many a column trying to hold the police accountable. She can't really make up her mind. We'll get to really, it's buried in the column about why she wrote this, but you're talking about having no institutional memory, no idea of what it used to be like or is um, or was like in Chicago 5, 10, when was 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. When was it better to be a cop in Chicago than it is now? Under the Burge times? In the 60s? When? Obviously, Mary Mitchell thinks it was better some time ago. It'd be interesting to see if she could come up with an answer to that question. A couple more quotes. Meanwhile, Police Superintendent Dave Brown has been quietly taking care of business. I wonder what the hell she's basing that on. Let's see. I don't have faith in the rest of this. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can drop in the comments if you think I'm wrong, by all means, in any of the platforms you're watching this. So I continue with the column. The city's year-to-date homicide clearance rate now is 58.45% compared to 51.88% year-to-date in 2019. Four years ago, the city's murder clearance rate was just 29%. I continue. The police department sends out daily alerts notifying the news media of people who were arrested and charged with serious crimes, including homicides. That last bit is total bullshit. That's PR for the department, so that's irrelevant. Why she thinks that's important, I have no idea. But the reality is none of this column, this column's a total um, joke. It should have never been printed, but there aren't editors that would stop this kind of shit on any of the news in Chicago. That co this column's crapola. But let's go. Let's get to the stats. The important part. The one of the most doctored, manipulated statistics in all of policing is clearance rates. Mary Mitchell's not young. She's been around for a few rodeos. This is not her first one. She should know, she should know that this statistic is total and utter crap Ola. It's a statistic that the media rarely looks into but swallows whole like nobody's business, just like Mary Mitchell has done here. So the homicide, the homicide clearance rate went from 29% to 51.88 to 58.45. And she's buying that garbage. Now, during this time, Eddie Johnson was involved. He took over after McCarthy destroyed the department and destroyed the detective division. If you read the cop blogs and you read the media, right? McCarthy reorganized, trying to make uh, how Chicago was run into what it was in New York and used in limited resources and reduced the number of areas the detectives were in. So despite that, Homicide rates went up. Homicide clearance rates went up. Then Beck came in and made changes. Clearance rates still going up, though. Then David Brown comes in, and the clearance rates are still going up. Now, Beck made changes to Eddie Johnson because the changes Eddie Johnson made weren't working. The changes David Brown did were because the changes Beck did were not working. How in the hell does the homicide rate keep, clearance rate keep going up so dramatically if the damn changes the previous superintendent were making didn't work? A doubling of the clearance rates in this Sun-Times columnist who's been around for a lot of rodeos believes it. 
It's staggeringly dumb. Staggeringly dumb. Even for the Chicago media. Staggeringly dumb to, to believe it. Here's a quick little primer on clearance rates. Maybe we'll write an issue, we'll write an issue brief on it. Clearance. One offender, one arrest. They arrest the offender. Cleared. Now they put cuffs on them and take them into custody. It's cleared. Whether or not there are ever charges filed does not make a difference. That's on the state attorney. So they can arrest someone, put cuffs on them and say, we're going to charge you with murder. They go to the felony review and it gets denied. They never end up pressing charges. They release them. Don't make a difference. We know who did it. It's cleared. CPD puts a little checkbox. This is through the Uniform Crime Report. That allows them to keep stats this way. That's bullshit. It's manipulated. That's what it is. It's manipulated. Now, it gets worse. They know who did it. No one has to validate they know. And the, the offender has fled to jurisdiction. They know who did it, but the offender died. They know who did it, but they can't prosecute the person. No one validates that number. There's no system to validate it. Journalists should be validating it regularly. They're not. No one's validating it. So it just might be the fact that the 29% under Eddie Johnson was actually just a truthful number. And that the 58 is completely full of crapola. Now, why would I say that? Well, it has. it turns out that David Brown, the superintendent of Chicago Police Department, while he was in the superintendent of Dallas, had a, has a long history of being part of plots to manipulate crime statistics in Dallas. That is what he does. That was his pattern. I knew, I called journalists and others in Dallas. We knew this was coming. And Mary Mitchell, because her and her colleagues at the Sun-Times never did research into Brown's history, are buying this hook, line, and sinker. It's a joke. And she really loves when they send out those notifications when they charge people. Oh, my God. Such a good job, Superintendent David Brown. You, your department sends out emails so that we can write good stories about you. Otherwise, I know it's public relations. All right, I continue. They've accomplished this goal while facing the, per the perils of foot pursuits and car chases involving some who aren't about to go peacefully. On Thursday, the Sun-Times reported that 66% of Chicago police car chases in 19 ended in crashes. Eight of those crashes were fatal. What does it have to do anything with the story? What does that have to do with the point she's making in the column? The truth is she has no idea. That was basically cut and pasted, more or less, from the Sun-Times story about that that we covered on Monday. I think it may have been last Friday, but I think it was Monday on the show. That's it. That has nothing to do with it. She just thought, oh, that sounds good. Maybe I'll cut and paste and put that in. There Are there more foot chases and car pursuits now than there were? She hasn't have a clue. She never looked. She doesn't care. She thought that sound good. So she put it at the bottom of her column. This is stenography at its best. You have to question the value of, of, of um, columnists if this is what you're getting. Why was this column written? Well, let's get to the crux of the point here. Why did, as my dog chimes in here, why did she write this column? Well, it turns out that Miss Mitchell has a friend whose husband is a cop. And she talked to her about, you know, cops are people too, and they're doing their best. That's what it takes to get a Sun-Times column written in your favor to support your political perspective. What is it? It's you have a friend that's a columnist. Man, this column's a piece of crapola. But it's Chicago, so that's what you come to expect. Just unflinching, undying loyalty to report statistics. And the fact that somehow the clearance rate doubled and didn't find it suspicious at all. It's mind-blowing. 
mind blowing. Okay, we're gonna move on to our second segment. This is an interesting development. I tried to make some calls today, didn't get any responses. So hopefully I'll have some for you next Wednesday when we ear again. We're taking a little vacation between now and then. Uh, the article is from the Chicago Sun-Times. Black Caucus decides civilian police oversight compromise. Sorry, Black Caucus back civilian police oversight compromise over Lightfoot's objection. Wow, well, that's interesting. So this is the compromise between COPA and GAPA. They came together and the two groups and organized and came together and settled on a compromise ordinance. So the two set of sets of groups, I guess, is the best way to pursue it. So what's missing from this, even though they have some really supportive quotes from Jason Irvin, Alderman, Westside 28th Ward, I think, Garfield Park, a little bit of Little Italy, some of Austin, I believe. In the column, first of all, well, let's start, let's start back up. The bigger question is why after six years would it take the Black Caucus to back an ordinance, one of these ordinances? They have been in play for multiple years. Why so long? That's one. Talking about a horrific reporting. They were unable to figure out the vote. The vote was 75%, which is what's needed, I guess, to back it. So 75% black, of the Black Caucus supported it. Well, who exactly in that Black Caucus supported it? Who didn't? That'd be interesting to know, right? I mean, if I'm CPAC and GAPA Black Lives Matter, I'm calling every alderman's office and getting it in the Black Caucus and getting a formal answer on the record. Were you the one? Were you? Who did it? Who didn't vote for it? That would be one question. Now... What you hear is not an unqualified, complete 100% backing of the ordinance. That's not what you get. They're so weak, it's ridiculous. And just before I read this, I want to let you all know. I was involved, I was involved in helping write the ordinance that came up with, was called Fair Cops, originally. It was written by... In, in bulk by most of it by the Community Renewal Society. Ryan Wallace, I believe, at the Community Renewal Society, if I got Ryan's last name right again. Haven't seen him in years. But I was involved in helping them draft the ordinance to fair cops. What did fair cops give us? It gave us COPA, the Citizen Office of Police Accountability, and eliminated the Independent Police Review Authority, or IPRA. It also gave us the Deputy Inspector General for Public Safety, which I've said on the show before was my idea from the beginning, create an auditor's office. I went a lot of it out, outside the public uh, inspector general's office, but that's either here for, or there for now. The Black Caucus took three months, maybe five months, before they would found someone to introduce it, which was Alderman Irvin, and then he weakened it immediately. After months and months and months and months of Rom's people weakening it. Because that's how Millie Mouse weak, corrupt, morally bankrupt the city council is all right so take that into context and then you think it took them the same black caucus years multiple years to finally get 100 percent by either cope or gap and now it happens to be the ordinance but are they 100 percent behind it let's inquire in this story so here's a quote i wear the jacket is that this is from mayor lightfoot you talk about a crapola Quote, Ola. Quote, quote, Ola. Uh, Crapola, quote. Check this one out. I wear the jacket, as, ma as every mayor does, for violence in this city, for crime in this city. And the notion we're going to give, we're going to outsource that to someone else and, ha and have no responsibility, no ability to impact this. I don't know anyone who thinks that's a good idea. Lightman said during a press conference last month. Well, Lori, all the community organizations and citizens of your city that back COPA and, GORP, uh, COPA and GAPA and now the compromise ordinance think it's a good idea. Lori, look right here. I think that's a good idea. There are plenty in the Chicago Coalition for Police Accountability that think it's good. There's plenty in Black Lives Matter and BYP 100 and other community or other organizations um, organizing uh, young men and women of color throughout the city. They think it's a good idea. The Civil Rights Bar thinks it's a good idea. 
So the fact that there's no one is clueless. It's just a lie. This is probably a wordsmith statement that they talked about a, a hundred times to come up with the perfect BS statement. I bet you this was actually released. Um, that's a joke. You're, you have done nothing on police accountability for the first 730 days of your administration. Why would we believe that you're going to do anything more? Brown was a horrible pick. Superintendent Brown, obviously a horrible pick. So what track record do you have as mayor to say you're going to do something to hold people accountable? Your administration's still fighting for you like crazy. You don't want to release a damn bit of data or, or records. You're fighting video releases. You're doing everything you possibly can. Nothing new from Mayor Daly or Rahm Emanuel. Congratulations. So trusting you ain't it. We don't want you to have this ability because you won't use it. And they are accountable because the commission that the COPE on GAPA proposes that, are, that may or may not, depending on how the uh, referendum is, have the ability to fire the superintendent and hire the superintendent, they're elected. So they have exactly the same accountability you do, Lori. They're accountable to voters. So this is Jason Irvin, if I'm not mistaken, 28th Ward Alderman. When I, when I hear, particularly from people in communities that are most impacted by violence, oh no, this is still Lori, I'm sorry, still Lori Lightfoot. When I... When I hear, particularly from people in communities that are most impacted by violence, is please, Mayor, don't walk away from us. We need you to help us manage what's going on in our neighborhoods. Those may not be the loudest voices. They may not be the people that are marching the streets, but they are very much concerned about what's happening in the neighborhoods. So we have to come up with a plan that, that is also responsive to them. Lori, what's been going on in those communities has not worked for probably a hundred years in Chicago. You've put forth no plan. You said you were gonna pass this community commission in your first hundred days. We're now at 730 and you still haven't passed it. You still haven't introduced it. So for those that don't know, she said, she walked away from the co negotiating table at Copan Gap and then said, hey, I am going to introduce my own. That was months ago. She's stalling forever. I hope what the Black Caucus I hope the Black Caucus gets on board. They supposedly, according to Carlos Ramos, uh, Alderman Carlos Rom, uh, Ramo, uh, Carlos Rosa, Ramirez Rosa, sorry. Um, this now gives them the votes to override a veto, and they're going to pass it and override the veto if she vetoes it. I doubt that. If you read the article close, and I think people should, although it's not that great, you'll see that Jason Irvin talks about, well, if the mayor's going to introduce one, she should get to it now. And if she doesn't introduce it, we'll strongly consider it. You know, we're going to go, let both go through the legislative process. That doesn't sound like anything. I think this is more the Black Caucus trying to hopefully push Lori into getting her version in. But if I'm Lori, I don't feel like I, I have, they're, they're bluffing. They're weak. She knows that. She knows that from the years of watching them. They're as weak as possible. Um, this is nothing new. Okay, speaking of nothing new and going off, <laughs> mounting. This is CPD superintendent. I mean, CPD superintendent. Former CPS CEO under Richard Daly. Paul Vallis, he's a fr friend of the show. He's on the show all the time. Because he just spouts off nonstop, never ending, ever ending on Twitter and social media. I don't know what he thinks this is getting him. It befuddles me. He, um, he's got, he took a big ninth in the last mayoral race. Even if Lightfoot is weak, what does that get him? Eighth? I don't know why he's doing this. Oh, I should say that we talked about this last show. He's got, a, he's got at least one kid that's a cop, so he's very pro-union and pro-cop. So let's take a look at what this tweet says. Two more cops shot. That 16 shot in 10, 108, sorry, shot in 15 months, or shot at in 15 months. Mayor says pray for peace. Let's pray mayor fills police vacancies and ends failed strategy with that strips police districts and cops and exhausted cops with 12-hour work days and canceled days off. Pray Fox stops releasing felons. Now, Paul Ballas doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. 
This is pure politics. No one really cares what he's talking about. He's a has-been for the most part. He's going to play no role in anything, but he can't stop spouting off at the mayor. I don't know if he dreams of some like a miracle election that he's going to come in. Let me just say, he's doing what the media can't help doing because it's politically expedient, because that's what political um, people that are exploit the hell out of everything do. You cannot compare the pandemic years to any other year of crime statistics in Chicago. It is not valid. It is not reliable. It is not ethical. It is not moral. But don't have to worry. Paul Vallis is a politician in Chicago, so you won't have to worry about moral and morals and values and ethical and reliable and valid stopping him. He will continue. Mayor, fill those vacancies. Really? Why, pa Paul? Like your buddy, uh, President Catanzaro from the FOP, do you have any evidence that it, it um, that those vacancies are going to do something to stop crime? Is there some magic relationship between the number of officers in Chicago and the amount of crime? Is there some reliable number scientifically driven about how many cops we're supposed to have? He does not know, and worse, he does not care. It's about exploiting crime and violence to store political points to hurt the mayor and improve whatever contract he can get for his kiddo as part of the fraternal order of the police. That's what this is all about. His buddy, the FOP president that he likes so much with 50 complaints, all from, almost all from internal sources, he was all, it's all about sentences, long sentences. And then the second minute, if you watch our show on Monday, it was about, we need more cops. Well, it can't be both long sentences and cops. You just said a minute ago it was sentences. This is what you're getting from this ilk. This is what you're getting, and we'll talk more about the ilk in, um, when we get to our social media fails after the break. This is pure BS. It's pure rhetoric. rhetoric. It's not constructive. Vallis, although he'll, he won't say it, this is an alt-right wing crime and punishment ideology that Vallis is driving to support his kids or kid or kids that are cops. That's it. Nothing more. He has no evidence anything that he is pushing has any basis in science. He also has no science to show that because he's when he's talking about fox locking people, I was talking about bail reform. He's got no science to show bail reform results in more violence on average. Doesn't. We have science to show that before the pandemic, it didn't have any increase in violence. We have science for that, Mr. Vallis. Do you want to contest it? Can you read a study? Dave Olson, Don Steeman, professors, Loyola University, go look it up in the archive on YouTube or Facebook. They've been on the show. They did a study. Pre-pandemic, bond reform had no impact, no discernible change in crime or violence in Chicago. Post-pandemic, I mean, post-bail reform, like 18 months or two years to the pre no change, no statistically meaningful change. It's just BS and rhetoric. I don't know, so besides his son, I don't understand what he's doing with this because I got to tell you, he's got no shot at mayor. Uh, maybe he's going to waste some rich guy's money again and run again. Maybe he can take eighth or seventh. Maybe he can try to beat Alderman Fioretti or former Alderman Fioretti. Okay, we'll be back. We're going to take a one-minute break with some information about our nation program, and then we'll be back to talk about a trip article on gun, sh uh, gun used in a shooting in Chicago. Join a group of engaged and committed individuals advocating for transparency and accountability in the local justice system around the country. Get engaged through crowdsourced research projects, digital activism, public policy advocacy, or become a social media ambassador. Our criminal justice system will not reform itself. Communities must demand it. Transparency can be the fuel for justice our local communities need to combat the weaponizing of data by our justice system. Transformation of our justice system cannot occur until we know exactly what they are doing and who they are doing it to. Get involved today. CJP Nation. All right, thank you so much. We are back. We're going to go right into our next segment. This is an article from the Chicago Tribune, which again, I'm not exactly sure why it was written, or at least should have been researched better. 
Maybe it's a jumping off spot for a much more in-depth report that seems just a very shallow one. So let me read you the article, the title. Gun used in day-long shootings rampage that left five dead from Chicago South Side to Evanston was likely used in other shootings going back to 2009 record show. What does likely mean? Was it used in other shootings or wasn't it? So, this is talking about the shooting spree that Jason Nightingale engaged in from Chicago Southside into Evanston, I think was eventually shot by Evanston cops, but on the Chicago side of the street, if I'm not mistaken, right on the border. The, the crux of the article is it's linked to four more shootings in Chicago dating back to 2009 that we know of, right? They matched casings. So I think that's where you're getting like likely. They found casings. I don't think they did a ballistics on the, on the actual bullets to match it, which one would have to say, well, if you found the casings and you're, it was a shooting and you know where the shooting happened, did you never find any of the bullets? Or maybe they were just in such a shape for all four shootings that they couldn't do a ballistics match. But let's just say that, okay? So let's just assume that, okay, good. It's linked to four more shootings. What does that tell us? Because they don't really, they tell you when and where, but they don't tell you any of the people involved. They don't tell you how the people may have gotten the gun. Because the reality is the four shootings they're talking about are unsolved. So there really isn't any information available from the Tribune. I mean, from the Chicago Police Department about the shootings. There were no victims. Oh, no, I, I mistakenly, no one died. So there were people wounded. I wonder why the Tribune didn't go talk to the people wounded about who might have shot them. Right? You know, like shoe leather or like maybe phone leather now calling. I don't know with the pandemic, but they didn't talk to any of the shooting victims. But they had this document they got from the CPD that says it was like attached to these four shootings. So that's what I say. They seem to have written a story because they got this document and that was enough. I think the getting of the document, hey, yay, insider stuff, that seems good. And it was a jumping off point for possibly a really good story. But take the time to research the hell out of it. Track down the victims. Talk to them if they will talk to you. Talk to their friends, their family about the shooting, witnesses, if you can get them. I know it was a long time ago for some of them, but they provide you no, really no other details. But like, hey, the shooting happened 2009. It happened here. In 2013, it happened here. In 2017, it happened here, right? I'm not sure the exact years, but that's it. And they did that because that's all they could do in this shitty, because all they got is that shitty document. They got nothing else. They didn't do anything else. They didn't talk to anyone. And they do mention in this story, which is important to note, this is nothing new. This has been going on for 30 years or 40 years in Chicago. We've known that um, guns that get used in shootings, especially around gang activity, get passed around or sold or rented. And they're sometimes involved in multiple shootings. This is nothing new. And it's so nothing new that they put it in the article. Which is why, okay, well, doesn't that by itself rule out the need to have the article? I don't understand. And then there's a good chunk of this article that's literally almost, if not a cut and paste, a retelling re retread of the of uh the nightingale murder uh murders and shooting spree what he did why do we need to read that again and then it's to say you know this was in this shooting south from the south side davenston killed ford or wounded three and got shot by evanston there was a paragraph there were multiple paragraphs going off over all the shootings that he did that day it was a horrific incident, but I don't understand why that should have been part of the article. The problem is if you take that out of the article, it really is nothing. There's nothing there. It's weak. It's shallow. It's the epitome of shallow. I don't know. They got that article. They wanted, they wanted to be lazy and wanted to build the story around it. So they cut and paste out of the Nightingale story and threw like some minimalist details about the other shootings. And it seemed to not make a call, and they had a story. It's really, and it took two people. Um, I'm not going to say the names because I'm not exactly sure. I know for sure one was Annie Sweeney, but I'm not sure of the other one. It's just not a great story, and it's not done well. So this brings us, ladies and gentlemen, the social media fails. 
Here we go. Alderman Rabin Lopez. He's a repeat, 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 repeat candidate on our, he's been, I think, in every social media fails we have. Okay, this is a, this is a tweet from OEMC that he's commenting on or retweeting. OEMC encourages residents to create a free Smart 911 safety profile, profile by visiting smart911.com or download the mobile app. At Smart 911 allows residents to create a safety profile that includes info they want 911 and first responders to have in the event of an emergency. Okay, what more of this is though, but first of all, let me get to Lopez's quote. I have been working with the city on this since the beginning of the year, though I am shockingly not mentioned. I fully support its implementation. Sign up today. I fully support its implementation. Sign up today. God, the more I read him and his tweets, the more he sounds like Donald Trump. Whiny. I mean, that's a Trump. Is that ever a tr ever so a Trump tweet? Though I am shockingly not mentioned. That has to be, that quote has to be a thousand times. Um, just whiny, complainy, kind of conspiratorial about why he wasn't mentioned. Part of this smart 911, as I understand it, is to link your home security cameras to the CPD and to OEMC so they have your feed. My opinion, very dangerous expansion of government um, government surveillance that should be uh, like your ring doorbell you can hook on to the CPD connect it's awful um, it's 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 solutions to pro it's solutions like this to major major problems that law and order people are drawn to like a moth to a flame because there are solu other solutions don't ever work out. They're always a failure. So it's always about increased surveillance in police, increased police oversight. I mean, police presence and their ability to do more things ever increase on that because at whatever level it is, it always fails. So they always need to increase it because then they can never admit they're wrong. They can never admit science has proved that, you know, what they're doing doesn't work. So it's always more and more and more and more. And that's what you're going to get out of Lopez, John Cass, Paul Vallis, Donald Trump. It's all about tokenism and no effort for real for form because then they'd have to admit that they screwed up or they actually made a mistake and they're not for that. So let's go to Lopez number two. The picture says a million words. Look who Mr. Lopez took a picture with most recently. There was the St. Jude, I believe, March for Gold Star Families and... For the police department, I think it was Sunday. John Cotanzara on the left, um, who is not in uniform. That's Alderman Lopez in the center. And I don't have the name of the officer in the picture. This is from the FOP's Facebook page. The link should be in the chat soon. Cotanzara, 50, remember, 50 complaints, mostly from internal sources. He's right now up on charges in front of the Chicago Police Board and is most likely going to be fired. If I'm an alderman, that's the guy I want to take a picture with. The guy that has more complaints than almost anyone in the department, almost all from internal sources, fellow colleagues, and his superiors. That's the guy I'm smiling with. Lopez doesn't care. He doesn't care. Could you get more like Trump? He doesn't care. He just wants to be a shiny alderman with his picture with a cop in his dress uniform and the head of the police union make him feel powerful or something. He must get some kind of trip on it. I don't understand what it is. Picture him says a thousand words, right? I mean, could you two less meaningful contributors? I think you would be hard to find in Chicago. John Cotton Zara, the president of the FOP and Alderman Ray Lopez. Um, total joke. Total joke. Um, I just think that picture is a mirror. It says, it says all you need to do, right? Um, and everything that's going on with police accountability and the George Floyd murder and the Laquan McDonald murder and everything that's going on around the country. Dante, right? I mean, we can go on and on and on these days. 
Who do you want to have your picture taken with? A cop who has 50 complaints. They tried to fire twice and is up on charge to be fired again. It's unbelievable, but Lopez has no shame. Okay, here's our last segment of our show today. And it's a perfect transition from uh, the conservative base of the city council, Ray Lopez, and the alt-right back the... uh, Back the insurrectionists in D.C., they're just a bunch of nice people, and I understand exactly what they did, John Contanzara, to this article from, I think it's the Quad City Times, and the headline reads, Rock Island police officers silently protest after Alderman called them agents of state violence. This is, I think this is hilarious, and this is what people on the right, especially, but police don't get. If you ask 99% of the, I shouldn't say that, that's not, that's untrue. If you ask the left or you ask almost anyone of color or anyone of conscience, regardless of they're on the left or the right, who is most likely, if there's going to be state, any violence from someone, a state actor, which the police are, If there's going to be violence from a state actor against them or their family, who's most likely to do it? The groups that I said will tell you flat out, it's the police department. Now, the right doesn't want to talk about that. They ignore that. It's a joke. Police are in your communities every day, all day, all night. They are licensed to kill. They have guns. They're trained to kill. They're trained like a paramilitary force. If you're going to face regulation for a violation, 99.999% of that time, if you committed any kind of violation of any regulation of law, the agency that is going to come to your door and hold you accountable or start the process is the police. The right doesn't like that. They want to think it's some mysterious IRS agent or mysterious bureaucrat. It's the white guy, mostly white guys, with guns driving around your neighborhood that are going to do it. That's who's going to do it. You are state actors. We have given you, the police fail to see this, we've given you authority. You're not in the Constitution. You don't have to exist. We don't have to have police. We are a free and democratic people. We have, we have allowed for the creation of the police And we are submitting to being held to a set of laws by police to start the system. But we allow that to happen. You don't have to exist. You're not in the Constitution. God did not create you. We allow you to be there. That is why your legitimacy is the only currency you have. You think the protests were bad this summer. If those protests really wanted to turn on the police, you'd be wiped out. There are 2.7 million people in Chicago. There are 12,000, 13,000 cops. You think you're going to win that battle? It's a joke. You're not going to. If there is a government agency that is going to commit violence from the state against people, it's the police department. Is everything police do state violence? No, absolutely not. Is everything they do illegitimate? Absolutely not. Are most cops bad? No, they're not. But the problem is, like I talked about this on uh, Monday's social media fails with Alderman Lopez again on one of his stupid tweets. It's the fact that the good cops don't tell on the bad cops. So we are forced to do nothing but lump you all together. You want to be considered good by the public? Turn your buddies in that commit crimes and violence. Period. Nothing else to say. Just full stop. So these cops are protesting and Alderman said, here, Alderman Parker referred to police, this is a quote, Alderman Parker referred to police as agents of state violence and noted the city and police department have no official foot pursuit policy. There was a fit pursuit policy and ended when the death, I think, of a black man. Shock. And um, I think the DA, shocked down there, I know you're going to be shocked by this, said the shooting was good. Your... You are, police departments are, state actors. You're in our communities every day. If any state agency or state actor ever 
is most likely going to commit violence against us, illegal violence, repression, it's you. And when you kill the Quan McDonald or torture people like John Burge or Dante Servin, Tamir Rice, we could go on and on and on. Brianna Taylor and on. I'm sure if I hit sit here, I can keep coming up with names. Robert Russ, Latanya Haggerty from years and years ago in the department. Two shootings and car chases closely behind. Both ended up murdered for no reason by black officers. I mean, by white, one white officer, one black officer. Cops covered up both. You can research them. When those things happen, you're acting with state-sponsored authority. You're a government agent. It's the government committing violence. You're an agent of state violence when you do that. Sorry. The cops want us to submit to their rule under the law, but they don't want to be held accountable under the law to anyone else because everyone else is wrong. They're unaccountable to everyone, but the public is, has to be accountable to them. And you can't fight back and you can't resist and you must just submit. It's a joke. But that's why you have so many cops and so many military ending up in the insurrection because that's how they think. That is to think through far too much of our police departments, far too much of our military, especially our police. You can see it just with all their social media and everything. They don't want to be held to account. It's democracy. Every government agent is held to account. That is the role of citizens in the country. But you don't care because you don't want to be held to account because you're not part of the government repression. Everyone above you in the government and everyone in every other government agency is part of the government repression and agents of state violence, especially against you. But you're not what you do when you do it illegally and against the rules and against the law in racist ways. That's not state violence. You're not a state actor. Who is less of a state actor than you? You're licensed to be a police officer by the state. You're employed by the state to be a, you're, you're allowed to have a gun and use the gun through state laws. Who is less of a, the good question would be, who could possibly be more of a state actor than you? What you're going to say, what they're going to say is some bureau, bureau, you know, bureaucrat, the mayor. Yeah, but they're elected and she can't kill us, but you can all right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back a week from today. I'm taking a vacation for the first time since January of 2020. Very happy about that. We're going to be back for one show next week on Wednesday, uh, the 26th, if I got the date right. And then we're going to wait till after the holiday and come back. I think it's on the 2nd of June to start regularly back Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 530. Thank you so much for tuning in. You got ideas for who you want to see on the show interviewed on the show topics covered hit us in the chat of any of our social media platforms we're airing on um or hit us up at info chicagojustice.org and we will hopefully cover it for you thank you so much stay safe we'll see you middle of next week